Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. As ever, short and succinct questions and responses are appreciated. And at question number one, I call Mark Cruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission's recommendation that no further new greyhound tracks be permitted in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Mary Gujol. The Scottish Government will collectively consider all of the recommendations made by the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission before any final conclusions are reached. Uh, the Minister, uh, Mary McAllen, confirmed on 6 October last year during a parliamentary debate that greyhound racing would be included within our commitment to consult with stakeholders on extending licensing legislation to animal care services. The responses to that consultation, along with the views of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee and SOC's recently published report, will inform our next steps in respect to greyhound racing in Scotland. And I really would encourage all interested parties to share their, uh, their views via the full public consultation, which is scheduled to be launched in early summer of this year. Mark Cruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and can I also be the first to uh, welcome her uh, back to her position and uh, pay tribute to the considerable leadership we've seen from her over the last two years. Um, this report highlighted that, and I quote, a dog bred for racing in Scotland currently has poorer welfare than other dogs. The inherent risks of injuries and deaths associated with racing greyhounds up to 40 miles an hour around oval tracks alongside the lack of veterinary presence at unlicensed tracks led the Commission to conclude that a phase-out is desirable, in their words. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree it's now time to explore options for a phase-out in a way that leaves no dogs behind? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to, to thank the member for his comments, but the Scottish Government absolutely appreciates the depth of feeling that is associated with this, and that's why we've committed to undertake a full consultation later this year into animal care services, which is going to now include greyhound racing too. And Scottish ministers will make clear our final position once we've been able to gather all of that evidence, and that includes looking at those recommendations that have been made by the SOC report, and uh, once we've received all the responses of the consultation, we will fully consider all of that, that information and then consider what those next steps might be. But I would just want to reiterate that for, uh, the forefront of all of this is about it's ultimately about improving animal welfare and I would want to assure the member that that's really at the front of our considerations on this. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I support my colleague in this regard. I know the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission also supports a snaring ban in Scotland recommending sale of snares and their use to be banned on animal welfare grounds. But the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Bill is just restricting, as it's been laid, restricting the legislation. Can I therefore advise the Cabinet Secretary that I will pursue, I imagine with others, a complete ban on snaring? Can I suggest in this instance that this question is not relevant to the substantive question? I'm going to move on to question two, Jamie Hargrove Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government the number of affordable homes required to be built to meet the needs of rural communities across the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, local authorities, as the statutory housing authority, are responsible for assessing affordable housing needs in their area and setting out their plans to meet these requirements in their local housing strategy and strategic housing investment plan. We are committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which 10 per cent will be in our remote, rural and island communities. We are making £3.5 billion pounds available this Parliament for affordable housing across Scotland. The Highland and Islands region will see an increased investment in affordable housing of over £468 million this Parliament. That is £85 million pounds more compared to the previous Parliament. Jamie Hucker Johnson. Thank you. Um, there is a huge pressure on housing across my Highlands and Islands region, and this is leaving many families and many key workers struggling to find a home. And yet the Scottish Government has, has allocated less than £18 million pounds of the £30 million available from the Rural Housing and Island Housing Funds. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain why this support is not being fully utilised? And how will she make sure that in the future, funding gets to those communities in my region that they desperately need to build the homes that so many desperately need? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, just to reiterate to the member that through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, so that's the general uh, housing investment fund, uh, the Highlands and Islands region is seeing uh, 468 million this Parliament, 85 million pounds more compared to the previous Parliament. But he referred to the 30 million rural and island housing fund, which of course has been described as a game changer. It's a demand-led 
budget. It adds value, but it's demand-led, so the projects need to come through. So it offers support to community groups and others, uh, complementing delivery by councils and registered social landlords. And of course, through all of those funds, uh, between 2016 and 17 and 2021-22, we've supported the delivery of almost 8,000 affordable homes in rural and island areas. But there's more to be done, and of course, that's why we're bringing the Remote Rural and Island Housing Action Plan forward uh, in the, the near future in order to see what more we can do to help uh, rural housing development. Um, Rhoda Grant. Officer, um, the demand is there and it's urgent, but affordable housing policy is made with urban areas in mind, not rural areas. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she will review housing policy with an eye to rural areas, what works for rural areas, because young people are being forced away from home and essential services are remaining unstaffed because of a, a desperate lack of housing. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> well, we have done that, and that's why the work on the remote rural and islands housing action plan has been underway for some time. I hope Rhoda Grant has uh, been uh, inputting into that, and um, we certainly have made sure that key stakeholders have been involved in the, de the development of it. We're working with key agencies, including Highlands and Islands Enterprise and, of course, the South of Scotland Enterprise and the housing sector to strengthen joint work um, to support key workers and employer-led housing. So that plan will be uh, published in the coming weeks. But I, where I do agree uh, with Rhoda Grant is that we do need to do more around key worker housing in rural areas, and that's why I'm keen through the plan and other work to make sure that we do more about, and I'm happy to, to speak to, to her further about that. Question number three, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how many GP surgeries are not currently accepting new patients. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government does not hold information on the number of GP surgeries operating with closed lists. Under the terms of their contracts with NHS boards, GP practices must apply to the local NHS board if they wish to close their parent patient list. The process for closing lists ensures that their practices do not have to register more patients than they can treat safely, and practice closure notices should include conditions for reopening of the lists. We expect all NHS boards to ensure that everyone is registered with a GP practice. Neil Bibby. Uh, I think it would be helpful if the Scottish Government could find out that information. Uh, I recently met with residents of Tweker in Eastern Bartonshire, which has traditionally relied on two GP surgeries in Kilsyth and Kirkintillic, as well as previously having a weekly satellite service. New residents, however, told me those surgeries are no longer accepting new patients, and the satellite service has not been restarted since COVID. They are instead having to travel to a third GP surgery with poor and unreliable public transport links. I also spoke to a Mrs Carey, who, because of a lack of GP out of our services, had to wait six hours to be taken 18 miles to the south side of Glasgow for treatment. What is the Minister going to do to fix the problems which are having a huge impact on people in Tweka? Before I bring the Minister in, we must have more concise questions and responses. Minister. So, first of all, let me assure the member that my officials will be engaging with all the boards and health and social care partnerships to ascertain their plans for that area. I am absolutely clear that health and social care partnerships and health boards in the two local authority areas concerned need to work together to ensure that the patients and their needs are met in Twecher. Sandish Gohani. With the SNP cutting £65 million from the primary care budget, it is little wonder GPs are struggling to take on new patients and GP surgeries are closing their doors forever. Will the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, will the Minister commit to reinstating the £65 million to protect general practice and patients? Minister. So the member will be aware that we have more GPs per head of population in Scotland than in other, every other UK nation. The Scottish Government is committed to recruiting 800 new GPs by 2027. We are significantly investing in a range of recruitment and retention initiatives so that being a GP remains an attractive career choice, as well as having recruited, launched our GP recruitment marketing campaign in June 22. 
Now, I know that for the new incoming Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care and NHS Recovery, primary care will be an absolute key area, and I know that he will be keen to meet with all interested parties to find the best way forward for that area of his portfolio. Question number four, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to address any poverty-related issues in schools. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government is committed to closing the poverty-related attainment gap and has a long-standing commitment to investing a billion pounds in the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Our spending plans for 23-24 across education and skills provide additional funding members to address the cost of living crisis. This includes £13 million to continue the school clothing grant, an additional £16 million resource and £80 million capital to fund the expansion of free school meals for all primary six and seven pupils in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, and investing £22 million to provide meals during the school holidays to the children who need them most. Bob Doris. Uh, President officer, a key anti-poverty initiative for Scotland has led the UK has been extending universal free school meal provision, increasingly important during the cost of living crisis. This policy is at the heart of our SNP government strategy, with universal entitlement currently provided up to P5, with an intention to roll out to P6 and 7 as soon as possible. I am sure the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary rather, will appreciate parents are keen to see this delivered. So can I ask for an update on that progress and what delay may be a result of capital works requiring completion? Can the Scottish Government not support councils where they are already ready to deliver this, Thank to deliver you, three Doris. universal school meals in P6 and 7 as soon as possible? Okay. Um, I would ask again that members ensure that their questions are concise. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my original answer, we are of course um, going further uh, than uh, the free school meals that we have at the moment, which is the most generous provision anywhere in the UK. We will see the expansion to primary six and seven pupils in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment as that first step. Bob, Ross, Bob Doris quite rightly points out to some of the challenges that some local authorities have in terms of capital project work that is required, but that is exactly why uh, we are investing that £80 million of capital funding in support of local authorities, and that is in addition to the £30 million they have already been given. Question number five, Maggie Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent reported comments by the Children and Young People's Commission of Scotland regarding children and families with no recourse to public funds being unable to access frontline services in Scotland, what action it can take within devolved powers to monitor the situation of any such children and families, including any support that can be provided? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. The Scottish Government is clear that people with uh, no recourse to the public funds should be able to access public services unless the service is restricted under the UK Government's immigration rules. The Scottish Government and COSLA uh, published the Ending Destitution Together strategy in 2021 with the aim of preventing and mitigating destitution caused by the impact of NRPF restrictions as far as possible within devolved powers. The Scottish Government will continue to monitor this area and do all we can within devolved powers to protect and support our communities while obviously urging the UK Government to change its position on this matter. Maggie Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Local authorities do not routinely publish data on the numbers of children and families subject, subject to NRPF or how they monitor the issue, including costs and access to support. There are concerns about resourcing of local health and social care partnerships to support them deal with the complex mental health needs involved. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider putting its current guidance, the joint national guidance with COSLA on NRPF, in, into a statutory footing and consider what needs to be done to provide the specialist mental health services required in different parts of the country? Cabinet Secretary. So the national guidance for local authorities sets out the current legal framework and good practice to assist local authorities in meeting their statutory duties and delivering an effective response when working with people who have no recourse to public funds. The Scottish Government has provided funding of £223,000 to the Simon Community Scotland in partnership with SAFE in Scotland to explore and address challenges that people with no recourse to public funds face in accessing support for their mental health. And I'm happy uh, to uh, speak to, to Maggie Chapman in more detail about that. Question number six, Carol Mockin. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on investment in research and coordinated care services to support those living with long COVID. Minister Marie Todd. 
We are funding nine Scottish-led research projects on the long-term effects of COVID-19 with a total funding commitment of around 2.5 million. This includes projects to better understand the symptoms of and factors associated with long COVID, to examine effects on cognitive function and to evaluate rehabilitation approaches. In 2022-23, we've made an available an initial three million from our 10 million long COVID support fund to support NHS boards to increase the capacity of existing services, supporting those with long COVID to develop, develop these into more clearly defined local pathways and provide more coordinated experience for those accessing support. Carol Mockin. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? I recently visited the Lister Centre in Kilmarnock, where, amongst other pieces of extremely important work linked to heart health and physiotherapy, the team will also be looking at providing Ayrshire and Arne's dedicated long COVID support. The work the team do is incredible and should be commended. However, the reality is having access to coordinated long COVID care services is not guaranteed and it is a postcode lottery. And we know that it is those from the most deprived areas who are the most likely to report these symptoms. Therefore, will the Minister commit to making it a priority to ensure further resource is provided for long COVID to ensure there is adequate research into its lasting impacts and clinics available right across Thank the country you. Thank to you, help Ms. those Malkin. suffering? Minister. So, uh, absolutely. Our Chief Scientist Office research funding schemes are open to applications on long COVID and they are very much welcomed. And they go through the CSO's standard independent expert review process to allow funding decisions to be made. The the sign NICE and RCGP guideline on long COVID is a living guideline, which means that its operation is reviewed and um, decided, you know, the decisions are made in a dynamic way to continue or to improve services. Organisations responsible for its development continue to actively monitor the global evidence base on COVID and to make sure that the recommendations are informed by the most up-to-date and high-quality evidence, regardless of where the studies um, generating that evidence is. I must take the Thank you, Minister. Um, we must move, move on to the next question, and a question number seven I call Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Learning for S Sustainability Action Plan in educational settings in the North East. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. As with any aspect of the curriculum, the implementation of Learning for Sustainability is led by local authorities and individual education settings, but I am aware of the great work taking place right across the country, including in the North East. The Scottish Government has been working with a range of partners to refresh its Learning for Sustainability Action Plan, first published in 2019, to further raise the ambition, and this will be published very shortly. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Promoting skills development aligned with the fastest growing industries of the North East is essential if Scotland is to meet uh, our net zero ambitions. Yet after another long drawn out announcement from the UK Government this morning, the Tory Government failed to give any credible detail on when the ACORN project will be given the green light to progress. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that Westminster governments will ever stop treating Scotland's energy as a cash cow for the UK Treasury and will it ever harness the skills here to deliver a just transition? I would ask, I would ask Ms Dunbar to remember that the focus of questions must be on issues for which the government has general responsibility. On the issue of the transition. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm not surprised um, that the Tories don't like to hear this once again, because there is a lack of focus on a just transition from the UK Government, and that makes the Scottish Government's job on this even more difficult. So while there are some welcome announcements in the UK Government's package, it did not provide a clear content and a strategy to decarbonise the energy economy. The decision not to award Scottish Cluster Track 1 status was, quite frankly, illogical. And while we welcome the UK Government finally setting out that the Scottish Cluster is eligible for Track 2, they have failed to provide any certainty around when that funding will be awarded. So this Government will continue to support the North East and ensure that we are supporting our highly skilled workforce. It is disappointing that the UK Government has once again failed to do so. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr Sturla Seer Jonsson, Ambassador of Iceland.